conversation at this critical juncture in our history as a country. And this is not something that we were offering only because of this. <laughs> it's been a critical juncture all my life. Um, <laughs> but I think it's become a unique critical juncture. How's that? Um, and I, I, I'm going to welcome Linda um, Sarsour, who is our special guest, who will be with us tonight to talk about race and Islamophobia. Because uh, part of what we're doing with this course is we're interrogating what race is in America. And part of what race is in America is nothing that makes any sense. And that means that we have to look at all the ways in which race gets constructed in this country, why and how. And it seems that on the anniversary of September 11th, which of course was a devastating tragedy for not just the city and communities across the city, but for the country, uh, and for the world, you know, the world um, grieved with us uh, after September 11th. And um, uh, it's very hard to, we, we should take a moment of silence, I think, first to remember those who lost their lives during the World Trade Center attacks and the Pentagon in DC. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I wanted to make sure to, that we talked about for this anniversary is not, we want to remember, right? And one of the hashtags uh, that has flown around social media is never forget. Um, but what is it that we shouldn't forget? And what does it tell us about how we move forward and how we move forward together? And one of the critical things I think we should not forget is one, how integral a part of not just the fabric of this country, but this world, uh, people who worship in the religion of Islam are to our nation, as are people of multiple religions and as are people who do not practice any religion. Um, Muslims have been in this country for centuries, and we tend to forget that. Um, we also tend to forget that uh, Muslim Americans, 82% um, are citizens are not undocumented immigrants or documented immigrants, but are actually citizens of these United States. It's also critical that we remember that Muslims are actually 3.3 million estimated. Our census does not actually collect religion, uh, so that is an estimate, but estimated at 3.3 million. But the projection is that Islam will be the second largest religion in this country by 2050. And in fact, if you look at those who worship uh, Islam across the globe, it is projected to be the second largest in the world by the end of the century. It is the fastest growing religion in the world as well as in this country. So it's something we need to understand, particularly as we go through a process of what I would call and what some scholars have called racialization, which is why am I talking about a religion as a race? Does that make any sense? And that's the question we want to interrogate. And I want to say a couple of things about the history of that and also share just a couple of video clips to remind us how we've been talking about Islam politically. I'm, I'm not going to share a lot because you all already know this, but I think it's a helpful reminder. Um, but let me just start with a couple of historical facts. You know, the first immigration law in the United States was the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1790. It was the first time the United States of America had an immigration law. And that immigration law determined who could be a naturalized citizen, who could come into the country and ask to become a citizen based on whether or not they were white. Now that created a really complicated conversation then in the courts. And I think I mentioned in the first class with those who were there, hundreds of years of really crazy case law in the Supreme Court of the United States, let me just tell you, trying to decide who is white. Because once you say that, then who is it? Because at one point in the country, it was not Irish. It was not Catholic. It was not Italian. Long story short, at a certain point, there's a Supreme Court decision that says, because Muslims, because, and specifically, I, this is very important because, of course, Muslims are, come from all over the world. <laughs> Muslims don't represent one region. And in fact, the Middle East is only 20% of the Muslim population of the world, okay? So that's an important fact to hold on to. South Asian, 
uh, Latin American as well as North American uh, Muslims come from all continents and all countries. But, but because the argument went because the Middle East was the cradle of civilization, this was the argument that Muslims were forced to mount because they had to argue into whiteness in order to get the opportunity to have the rights and privileges of citizenship of the United States, that they argue that because this was the cradle of civilization, some folks in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa might have something to say about that as well as Asia, but that they were therefore from a region where Christianity and Western civilization originated should be deemed white. And that eventually that argument won the day. And ever since then, I would argue that we have been going through a very, very complex process of re-racializing Islam in ways that other it from whiteness, certainly, but also other it in a way that contests um, uh, uh, and, and I would say reifies and preserves a racial hierarchy, right? So um, one of the things that, just to point out for those who did the reading for the course, is 9-11 is what some academics call the first wave of Islamophobia. Um, and that wave of Islamophobia following the September 11th attacks are actually part of what become um, the race, an additional layer, because I don't think it was the first layer, but an additional layer of a process of racialization that Linda is going to talk a lot more about both as, an, as a thinker and as a doer and as an activist that works across issues and groups. Um, but one, I just want to note a couple of facts and then share a couple of clips and then I'm going to introduce Linda. But literally the number of academic articles that were, had Islamophobia in the title, a very small handful before September 11th, that in one year that jumps to 500. And even more strikingly, between 2000 and 2012, Islamophobia goes from only 337 articles as a discussion to over 12,000. So academia is tracking something that it's seeing and that is happening in the world. So I'm using that just for those of us in the academy to note that there's something that we've also started capturing in social science and in research about this racialization process. Um, but let me just share a few clips because I think it's critical that we see where we've come even in the discourse because this isn't just an issue of partisanship. I think a mistake that we make in the United States right now is to see these as partisan issues rather than see them as racialization issues. And the reason that's true is because partisanship does not dictate necessarily what you think about or feel about race. It's not actually your party affiliation. And let me give you a, an example, which I will. The terrorists are traitors to their own faith, trying in effect to hijack Islam itself. The enemy of America is not our many Muslim friends. It is not our many Arab friends. Our enemy is a radical network of terrorists and every government that supports them. And before he makes this, actually, I showed you the second clip first. Before he says this, this is George Bush on September 20th, 2001, announcing essentially that he's going to war with Iraq, right, and Afghanistan, um, and, and speaking to the nation from Congress. But before this, even before this clip, uh, what he basically says is, Islam is not our issue, right? He literally says Islam is, is part of us and that the issue really is the small group and the governments that protect them, but we recognize that those who uh, purport to support, to, to uh, literally follow the law of Islam and Sharia are not doing so, and in fact are not following it when they commit terrorist attacks. That's from George W. Bush in 2001, okay? Now, yeah. I'm sorry, I lost it on my screen. All right, I gotta do it from here, but I can't read because I don't have my glasses on. Yeah. Okay, my screen, all right, you all can help me. This can become a group project. Um, I'm gonna go to, wait, let me see. Donald Trump. 
because I can I can see it. Yeah. Ah! Get off of that. All right. This is what happens when you can't yeah. see. This is 2015, a Donald Trump rally in North Carolina. We put out a statement today. We watched this, and it's impossible to watch this gross incompetence that I watched last night. And we put out a statement this is after a little San while ago. Ardina. And these people are going crazy. <laughs> they won't report it properly. Should I read you the statement? <laughs> Donald J. Trump is calling for now listen you got to listen to this one because this is pretty pretty heavy stuff and it's common sense and we have to do it remember the poll numbers 25 percent 51 percent remember the poll numbers okay so remember this so listen donald j trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of muslims entering the united states until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on We have no choice. We have no choice. I could play more um, because, in fact, I was. At, yeah, that's the way I felt. Um, I had to watch the whole clip to decide what to share. But, but part of what I want to say is he goes on. Uh, this is again after San Bernardino, and this is the beginning of his statement about the Muslim ban that he later tries. Uh, to impose his policy when he gets to the White House. But I, the important thing here is the difference between what George W. Bush, as a conservative Republican, says about Islam in 2000, and what Donald Trump, as, by the way, a not as conservative by some measures, by some measures on some issues, is saying about Islam. Um, the other piece that I wanted to show, and I'm not going to because of the AV issues, is after one of the things that folks were trying to do to take back the conversation after September 11th and after the tremendous growth of violence against Muslims, and one of the things that we should note is the fastest growing, after Charlottesville, right, when the nation really started um, understanding what the statistics had already been telling us, which were hate crimes were on the rise and at historic numbers, and that um, the issue with the terrorism that we are seeing in terms of actual deaths in the US are domestic, um, meaning they're from and literally 74% of all deaths uh, that have occurred by terrorism on our, in our country over the last decade are right-wing US-based non-Islamic groups, right? The um, right-wing supremacist, white supremacist groups, neo-Nazi groups, uh, only 2% from left-wing extremists. Um, and one of the things that we know is that the vast, over a almost 1,000 hate groups in the United States now, um, the fastest growing hate groups in the last decade are those who are attacking Muslims and committed to attacking Muslims. And that's another thing that we should recognize as we're th thinking and talking about how race works as a process. And with that, I want to introduce Linda, who is, I'm going to read her, it's so impressive. Um, I, I want to say, though, that I, from a personal standpoint, am so honored that Linda is here with us today. Um, she is someone whose generosity of spirit and courage are things I think that we should celebrate in this country. Um, I think we as Brooklynites who own her as a Brooklynite should celebrate her. Um, and I also want to say that, you know, f she's one of the most um, thoughtful and um, strong, but also gentle people I know. And I say that because if you read accounts of her, it really paints her in a way that is not a Linda I know or recognize. And I think it's an important opportunity um, to, to actually help see the human side of Linda Sarsour. Um, because she is a deep and important human being. Linda Sarsour is an award-winning racial justice and civil rights activist, community organizer, and every Islamophobe's worst nightmare, and mother of three. She's a Palestinian Muslim American born and raised in Brooklyn, New York.
She's the former executive di director of the Arab American Association of New York and the co-founder of the first Muslim online organizing platform, Empower Change. She's a member of the Justice League NYC, a leading force of activists, artists, youth, and formerly incarcerated individuals committed to criminal justice reform through direct action and policy advocacy. Most recently, she was one of the national co-chairs of the largest single day protest in US history, the Women's March on Washington. She's been named, yeah, yay, yeah, all right, holla. Uh, she has been named amongst 500 of the most influential Muslims in the world. Linda is most known for her intersectional organizing work, bridging communities and issues to build powerful movements. She's won numerous awards, including Champion of Change from the Obama administration. She's recognized as one of Fortune's 50 greatest leaders and featured as one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world in 2017. Thank you because we need you to be powerful. She's a frequent media commentator on issues impacting Muslim communities, Middle East affairs, and criminal justice reform, and most recognized for her transformative, intersectional organizing work and movement building. I give you Linda Sarsour. Wow, um, I'm so deeply honored and humbled to be here today and especially at the invitation of Dr. Maya Wiley. I've been an admirer of hers for so many years and had the privilege of working with her in many different times of my very short life. Um, uh, today's a pretty emotional day and I'm actually feeling like what a time to be alive when I'm sitting here being like, damn, George Bush wasn't that bad of a guy. <laughs> It's, I'm just sitting here like, what? I don't know. It's, that was a moment that I was having. Um, as a New Yorker and someone who was born and raised uh, in Brooklyn, I was actually a college student when 9-11 happened. And I would be remiss not to tell you where I was and what I kind of witnessed on that day as someone who was born here. I, I was wearing hijab about a year before 9-11 happened. Um, and I was a, a student and you know, my sitting in a class with a really old fashioned uh, teacher who was like never wanted to see electronics in the class and I'm saying electronics I'm talking about the days of the beepers were still around like I know some of the young people are like beepers what's a, what's a beeper um, and I remember that day that morning I was in a chemistry class and my teacher's cell phone rang and he picked up the phone and it was really odd to me because I'd had him a semester before he walked out of the classroom and he never came back and we waited for about 15 minutes thinking that he was, you know, I don't know, he had an emergency phone call, he was gonna come back and tell us, you know, either we were dismissed or not. Point of the story is he never came back. And now we're talking about the days of no Twitter, and there was no Facebook, and there was really no way to know what was going on. We didn't have flat screen TVs in our school playing CNN or MSNBC. You kind of just felt confused, and at the time I was at Kingsborough Community College, and for folks that know, it's on Manhattan Beach, so we literally, when we walked out into the campus, we put our hands out and there was literally pieces of paper like snowflakes, burned pieces of paper that were falling from the sky. And we still didn't know what was happening until a security guard in our school said, all I know is that a building hit the World Trade Center, that's all I know. Who, what, nothing else. There was no public transportation, so imagine I'm, my parents live in Sunset Park and this is all the way in like Sheepshead Bay. No public transportation, so we walked all the way from Sheepshead Bay all the way to Bay Ridge, which is where kind of my community is, where I live. And all the businesses were closed. It's a very heavily Arab business district. I walked by the mosque and the mosque's doors were bolted. And I was like, I didn't even know that our mosque had a gate. <laughs> and I was like, what's going on here? And like, it was literally like I was in a horror film. Like I just didn't understand what was going on at the moment. Continue to walk, I get to Sunset Park where my mother was watching my kids, and I walk into my mother's house, my mother passes me right by, and she says, I'm like, where are you going? She's like, I gotta go pick up your brother from school. He was in middle school in Park Slope. And I said, okay, but you're not wearing your hijab. And my mom's like, we can't wear it right now. I was like, what is this lady talking about? So I let her go, I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but you're my mom and you do whatever you do. And I walk into my house, my son's two years old, and he's like, mommy, fire, fire. 
And I sat down in front of the TV and that's when I started watching the loops. And by that time it was already like closer to 12 o'clock. So it was like three hours after everything had happened. Um, and on that day, I went from being a, just an ordinary New Yorker, right? Just that looked a little different than some folks to basically becoming a member of, a, of an entire group that was suspected of somehow having relations to a horrific attack that happened in our city. And I am an activist that was born out of the ashes of 9-11. I do this because of the things that I witnessed in my community in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. I watched SWAT teams raid coffee shops and take men right before my very eyes. I watched women come to mosques crying, telling us that they don't know where their loved ones, they were, quote, picked up by men. And I watched children asking for their fathers, some, for, some women of their sons. And that happened not in Bangladesh or in Pakistan or some country across the world. That was happening right here in one of the most progressive liberal cities in America. People, all levels of law enforcement raided our communities and we watched people and families separated because we decided to respond on that day by saying, okay, these people right here, they must all have something to do with this because those 19 terrorists happen to be Muslim. So that's where I come from. And when people wanna ask where I come from, where does this work come from? It doesn't come because I think it's cool to be an activist, which it is. I come from this as a directly impacted person that has witnessed things that have really questioned what it means for us to be the United States of America and the land of freedom of democracy and for who when we say freedom and democracy. So one of the things that happened in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 is that we started having a conversation about Islam. And it was some people that were leading the conversation. The conversation was Islam is a foreign religion. It, it, you can't be Muslim and, you, and American at the same time. It, it's incompatible. You just can't be both of those things together. Islam doesn't belong here on these lands. It belongs in some faraway land across the oceans. And it allowed for us to start speaking up and reminding people what Islam actually is and when Islam actually got here. Islam has been on the land, on this land, on these shores of, of, uh, of these United States of America before it was even called the United States of America. In fact, the first English colony, Roanoke Colony, which you know now as the coast of North Carolina, was built by enslaved Turks and Moors, galley slaves. So for me, Understanding that 25 to 30 percent of enslaved people who were forced here were Muslims. So for me, understanding that Islam belongs here because it's been here. And for me, I have a signature line that everybody knows that I use. Anywhere I go, I always say to people that I am unapologetically Muslim. You know why I'm unapologetically Muslim? Not because no one else deserves to be unapologetic about what religion they are or if they don't follow religion. It's because I connect my lineage, my religious lineage, to an enslaved people who figured out how to practice Islam under the watch of slave masters. And it is because of those enslaved people that my immigrant parents who came from Palestine were able to be Muslim in this country. So I have no choice but to be unapologetic based on the sacrifices of people who came before me so I can stand up here at the new school in front of you and give you a lecture about Islam. So I'm not gonna let anybody take that away from me or the communities that I organize with. Now, people will say, Linda, it's 16 years since 9-11. Do you not think that we healed as a nation? When it comes to Muslims, we're way, Muslims are way worse off today than we were even days and weeks and months after 9-11. And that brings me to something that Dr. Maya talked about. When you talk about racialization of a group of people. Muslims come from all walks of life. In fact, in these United States of America, one third of Muslims are African Americans. One third of our community are indigenous. They're, they are black people. And that's why I also get offended sometimes when people see me and they see me, I mean, I'm light skinned, I'm Arab American, they see me out here talking about criminal justice reform and ending mass incarceration and solidarity with black people. I'm not an ally. I march first and foremost for the one third of my community who are black and are directly impacted, not just because they're Muslim, but because they have to be Muslim and black in America in 2017. Those are my people. I fight for them and by extension when I am fighting for black Muslims, I'm fighting for all black people. When I'm fighting for black people, I'm fighting for all of us. So I wanted to get that pretty clear because I always hear this ally thing and it 
it rubs me, at least me personally, the wrong way. Now, why do I say that it's worse off now? And getting back to the racialization question, people will say, okay, this doesn't make sense, Linda. When people keep talking about anti-Muslim racism, how could there be racism against the whole group of people who, like you said, are white and black and we're South Asian, we're East Asian. In fact, the largest growing uh, sect of the Muslim community, believe it or not, are Latinos. That's the largest growing group of Muslims right now. Because it's easier for the opposition to racialize us and make us all one community because then they could create policies that target us based on our faith. So it doesn't matter if you're Palestinian or Indian or Pakistani or you're from uh, Mali or from Gambia. If you're all Muslim, then you're all one thing. And then you, people can say, prove that, Linda, to me because that don't make any sense. So I'm gonna get to that in a second. In the immediate aftermath of 9-11, we had a, in, hate crimes, right? People who were either Muslim or perceived to be Muslim were assaulted, vandalisms of mosques, you know, things of that nature. Starting in 2010, something additional started happening that actually wasn't happening in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. All of a sudden, we had people protesting the building of Islamic institutions. In the land of religious freedom, Apparently, we, that was the foundation of why we built this land, for people to come and practice their religion freely. There are people in our country who decided it was a good idea for them to start protesting the building of Islamic institutions. And it started right here at Ground Zero Mosque, right? Or the quote, Ground Zero Mosque. When in fact, there was a mosque there for many years before that. But tell that to the few people who want to believe fake news, but we'll get that in another second. But while people were looking at ground, the Ground Zero Mosque and focused on that controversy, we're talking about in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, in Midland Beach, Staten Island, in Old Bridge, New Jersey, in Temecula, California. There were mosque oppositions happening across the country and continue to happen across this country every day, every week. In fact, the largest case settlement on the building of Islamic institution was just one a few months ago in Sterling Heights, Michigan, where the mosque folks won a some multi-million dollar settlement for, uh, that because they were banned by the local zoning board and they won a lawsuit. Like why are we fighting about building Islamic institutions or any religious institutions in 2016? It's beyond me right now. Um, then during the elections, people said, oh, you know, Ted Cruz was like, look, we just gotta monitor all the mosques. And then all the good people came out and they said, what do you mean monitor all the mosques? We can't do that, that's unconstitutional. Like, don't worry about that, Linda, that's not happening. I was like, oh, let's talk about monitoring of the mosques. And then that goes back to the question about the racialization of Muslim communities. The New York Police Department. And two, we, the Muslims have been saying this since 9-11, nobody believed us. Cause you know, we're so paranoid, we're drama queens, we're you, you know, victim mentality. You want to say this is happening, you can't prove it. You can't prove that you're being spied on. That's just not how spying works. <laughs> so the Associated Press, somebody in the New York Police Department, right? That's how, it, that's how this works. Went to the New York Times and the Associated Press and they gave them boxes of documents proving that the New York Police Department was engaging in unwarranted surveillance of Islamic institutions, Muslim leaders, Muslim-owned businesses across the city. I'm not even exaggerating. There was one document that you people jokingly said was the Zagat survey of halal restaurants because they were literally cataloging all the Muslim owned businesses, the cafes, the butcher shops, the 250 mosques in New York City. They even created lists, lists that they said uh, radical leadership of the Muslim community and the most dangerous leadership, literally. These are all documents that you can find and if you ever, I highly recommend this book written by two AP reporters, they have both moved on into other um, uh, media outlets called uh, The Enemies Within, written by Matt Apuzo and Adam Goldman. And in there you will see some of the examples of the secret documents. So in the, when you look at all the documents, there were black Muslims monitored, they had Arab Americans, South Asians, West Africans, they did not discriminate. If you were Muslim, you were somewhere on that list. A place you visited, a place you ate at, a place where you bought your pita bread and halal meat was somewhere on that list somewhere. In fact, not only were they monitoring the businesses, 
my former, where I was the executive director of the Arab American Association, they in fact, what they did was we used to play in the NYPD soccer league. And our team won the 2009 Commissioner's Cup citywide. They were monitoring the places where the kids were practicing for the soccer league. That was in their documents, that's not my documents. In fact, they targeted my organization specifically in one of those documents. They wanted to find a confidential informant to put on the board of the Arab American Association of New York. They in fact created a profile. The person should be between ages 40 and 60, they should be a business owner or a doctor, whatever, basically looking at the makeup of the board and trying to find someone that would fit into the board, saying they should, they should either be Egyptian or of Syrian descent, again, looking at the makeup and trying to fit. What is a confidential informant got to do on the board of a social service organization that provides legal services and services to refugees, immigrants, and asylees in New York City? Do you not have something better to do with the resources and my taxpayer dollars? Anyway, therapy. Now, when that clip of Donald Trump saying that I will do a complete shutdown of Muslim immigration, people said, they can't do that, Linda. That's unconstitutional. You can't just ban a whole group of people from coming into this country. They just, he's just saying that it's all campaign rhetoric. You know how this works. It's all about the votes, right? That's just how politics works, you know, because I don't want to know anything about politics. I said, fine, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk with you here. I'm going to. The guy wasn't even in office for a week, and he already started with the Muslim ban. And then you got the critics that come and argue with me, but Linda, it's only seven countries. If you could do seven countries, then you could do 17. And you could do 27 and 49, and let me tell you why. Because you already did that in 2003. When we were talking about the Muslim registry program, and again, people said, oh my god, this is reminiscent of Nazi Germany. We would never allow that to happen on the watches of the American people. Everyone was outraged. I was watching people online being like, I will register. I'm going to be a Muslim. I was like, that's awesome. That's cool. I said, I wish you were a Muslim back in 2003 when the Department of Homeland Security created the special call-in registration program that demanded that any male over the age of 16 who was from one of these 29 countries of origin, all Muslim majority countries except for North Korea, that were not US citizens or green card holders were to come and register with the Department of Homeland Security. Right here at 26 Federal Plaza, I witnessed with my own eyes grown men who wanted to comply with the government who were standing on a line. It was March, it was freezing outside, people had blankets, they were sleeping out on the sidewalks to comply. Over 110,000 Muslim men complied with this program. Over 10% of them were put on deportation proceedings. Guess how many terrorists they found? Zero. Our taxpayer dollars. Separated families, terrorized communities, put people in chaos, not understanding what happens if I comply, if I don't comply, is this a deportation program, are they rounding us up? And you know what? 10% of those men were put on deportation proceedings just for the simple fact of trying to be good people and to comply with their government. Now, the reason why this is all important is because this isn't new, right? It's just the new group. Muslims are the new group now, but this is nothing new. So when people say, oh, you can't ban the Muslims, well, what about the time we banned the Chinese? That happened. You know, when we, we, people keep telling me, and one of the things that the critics say about me, and there's different kind of critics. There's the critics who challenge my ideas, and I welcome folks who want to challenge my ideas. You know, I have my own personal, you know, opinions about things and I want to be part of robust debates about them and there's the the naysayers but there's also the racists and the white supremacists and the neo-nazis and the right-wing Zionists we have to understand that when people say about me that I'm anti-american that's what they say I say just because I remind us and remind myself that we live in a country that has done really horrible things I mean, when I say to people that we are, we have to realize and recognize that we live in a country that was founded on the elimination of indigenous people, that's not my opinion. That's like a fact, that really happened. When you say to people that we were also founded on the enslavement of black people, that's not my opinion. 
That's not an analysis that I came up with based on years of reading. That is a fact. That happened, right? Segregation of people by races, that happened. And we could argue that still happens by looking at places like Brooklyn, Detroit, Chicago. Like We can argue that we still engage in segregation. Mass incarceration for many, and we've watched people argue this, and I agree with this argument, modern day slavery. Chinese Exclusion Act, that happened. We basically decided one day that this group of people from this country shouldn't come here. That, that's not an opinion, that's there, it's facts, all facts. And when I remind us that people say, oh, you're ungrateful, you're, no, I'm not ungrateful. I'm grateful that this country gave my Palestinian immigrant parents who came here from living under military occupation a better opportunity so that I could have better opportunities. But that doesn't mean because my parents had better opportunities that I ignore the history of a nation that has continued to target community after community because if I don't remember that, it's gonna keep happening to somebody else which is exactly what continues to happen. One of the most, one of the times in our history that for me is the most reminiscent when we talk about the Muslims is Japanese internment. What did they say about the Japanese that they're saying about the Muslims? It, literally, you would think somebody picked up a book and is reading out of the same playbook. The Muslims are not to be trusted. They're not loyal to this country. They got a secret plan, a hidden agenda. Sharia law is gonna take over America. You watch and see. You, uh, Keith Ellison, he's going far up there. He's one of them, the Muslim Brotherhood. These people are unpatriotic, I'm telling you. Same thing they said about the Japanese. They were not to be trusted. Their loyalty didn't lie. They were the enemy within. That's exactly how we have painted Muslims in America. They are the enemy within, the enemy to watch. So what happens when you vilify and criminalize and spend millions of dollars of propaganda on one particular community? When something horrific is about to happen to that community, what does the majority do? They turn a blind eye. And I wanna share with you a quick story that really, it just hit me really hard. I was lecturing at a university in the Midwest. Huge room, very diverse, mostly young people. And at the end, we had question and answer. And this young Muslim boy from the Muslim Student Association stands up and he says to me, Sister Linda, I want to ask you a question. He said, I want to know who lived in these United States of America at the time of Japanese internment. Who, who were these people? I'm not going to lie to you, like he took my breath away. And he just sat down. And I don't think he was asking that question expecting me to have an answer to the question. I think he was a concerned, anxious, young Muslim boy who wanted just to ask that question in public. So a few days later, I'm sitting in my office in Brooklyn and I thought to myself, I know exactly who those people were. They were the silent majority. They were the people who looked out of their kitchen window, saw their Japanese American neighbors being stripped and dragged into these camps and they closed that blind and acted like they didn't see what happened. It doesn't mean that they didn't think it was wrong. I'm pretty sure they thought it was horrible that what was happening, but they decided not to do anything about it. And that really resonates for me in this moment. And for anybody that knows me, and I'll say this then and now, if I was living at the time of Japanese internment camps, you better believe I would have been dead if I had to be because I would not allow things like that to happen on my watch. And we always say, who would I have been at the time of the civil rights movement? Who would I have been? You know, we always, what? Who are you right now? Because we are literally living a moment in this time where we gotta ask ourselves, are we going to be part of the silent majority? And we have an administration right now that is, I don't know how many things they gotta do or how many things they have to say for us to finally wake up. And I'll just say a couple of things about this administration. The people that I've been fighting against for the past 16 years of my organizing life all got powerful positions in the White House. They keep getting fired though, but they still got positions in the White House. <laughs> Anywhere from Stephen Miller to Bannon to Kobach, I have had, per like these people know my name, like specifically know my name. Like they know known me before they ever got to the White House. So 
Not only do we have neo-Nazis, anti-Semites, white supremacists literally got jobs in the White House and they proud of themselves. I mean, Gorsuch, like, I, like, I don't get me started. Like, literally people who are like actual neo-Nazis or, 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 or I'd, I'd say Nazis just because, anyway, like this is how bad it is. 800,000, 800,000 undocumented young people amongst us are literally in fear of deportation. I would argue that that is the new Jim Crow remix. If you can take 800,000 people by extension, their families, right? Who are now all part of a system, right? Because they got all their information now. Like you have to understand what's happening and what could happen and where we need to step in. When the, when the administration says trans folks are banned from serving in the military, I don't care where you are on the spectrum of war. You could be like, I'm, an, I'm part of the anti-war movement. It don't matter. Because if you could ban trans folks from the military, where will you ban them next? And then who comes after the trans folks? So we are literally under a relentless administration that is targeting us one by one, one by one. And the question is, when are we going to start organizing together to protect all of us instead of the continued silos that the progressive left in particular continues to organize in? And what I'll end by saying to you all, actually before I end, I want to tell you something really funny about, this, about the census stuff, because I think that's really interesting. So the census doesn't capture whether we're Muslim. They don't, they don't take religious, uh, religion is not captured. But Maya talked about the first wave of Arab Americans who were mostly from the Levant, who came here and basically had to argue into whiteness. So if you were from Lebanon, Syria, many of whom were Christian, were able to argue themselves into um, whiteness, and they uh, succeeded. But then you started getting the Arabs from Yemen. I don't know what, what Yemeni here is white, or when you're a North African from places like Egypt or Morocco or Tunisia or Mauritania, like you ain't white. So then in 2010, the US Census Bureau came, right? So for example, I'm Palestinian. According to the US Census, I'm white. So anyone who's from the Middle East or from North Africa, this government doesn't care what you think you are, they care what they think you are, and you are white. So in 2010, the US Census Bureau came to all the Arab American organizations around the country. They were like, look, we need you to help us because your people don't be filling out that census form. I said, what am I getting out of this? Oh, we're going to give you some funding and resources. I said, it's cool. I said, I got one condition. They were like, what's the condition? I said, you got to let me do this my way. They had no idea what that meant. They just wanted the people to fill out the census form. So in 2010, we started a campaign. It was called Check It Right, You Ain't White. <laughs> I still got the PSAs on YouTube. Um, and we started a national campaign. It wasn't just about the census. It was about a conversation that needed to, be, to start amongst Arab Americans that whiteness is not about the color of your skin. It's about the privilege that comes with being white. So if you look at my skin color and if I was not wearing this hijab, you might be able to say, yeah, she looks pretty white, right? I'm a, or, if I, or I'm like, or what we call white passing. But I don't have the privilege that comes with the whiteness, so I don't want the whiteness. So we have to understand what, it, what, what race is. It's based on an idea of who gets what based on being a member of that group. So this campaign to add a new category to the US Census is a longstanding campaign, but that 2010 campaign, what happened is if you checked, we told people check other, and then write in whatever you want, Yemeni American, Arab American, Palestinian, Egyptian, whatever you wanted to write, but just don't check white. What ends up happening is no matter what you put, you end up being put in the white box anyway. But what does that do? More work for the Census Bureau. So it must have been a lot of work. Because in 2020, there will be a new category on the US Census. And it's called MENA, Middle East, North Africa. And it was important for us to have another box and again, it's self-identification. So if you still want to put that you're white, you do that. I'm not going to lie, I used to put Asian. You know why? Because Palestine is like technically West Asia. But I was just rebelling. I was probably the only one that did that in this country. <laughs> but I wanted to share that with you because even this concept of race is a conversation that we continue to have even amongst the groups that we are part of, whether Muslims or even amongst Arab Americans, who again are very diverse. You could have a black Arab from Sudan 
And you could have a blonde and blue-eyed Arab from Syria, Lebanon. So even within the Arab community, we have been painted as one, when in fact, we also make up mult multiple racial groups. So this concept of racialization is really important as we put Arabs in one box and we put Muslims in one box, because it allows governments to then target us by the very policies, and it allows Islamophobia, which, by the way, isn't just about being anti-Muslim. It's anti-Sikh, it's anti-South Asian, and even anti-Hindu, if you look at some of the vandalism and things that have happened around the country. But I'll end by saying this to all of you, because of the moment that we are in, and what motivates me um, to do this work. And it's actually based on a quote. This is where I come from, where, where my organizing comes from. It's based on this quote by an Aboriginal woman named Leela Watson. And it, this is what it says. And I have it in my notebook, I have it in my office, I have it in my bedroom. Like It really informs the way that I organize with anybody in any movement, any space that I'm in. And Leela Watson says, she said, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come here because you believe that your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And that's where I come from. If Muslims are not free in this country, you are not free. If black people are not free in this country, you are not free. If trans folks are not free in this country, you are not free. So we have to work from this place that if freedom isn't for everybody, then it's for nobody. Thank you very much. I really just invited Linda so I could hug her a lot. So, um, so thank you for letting me. So we thought one of the things we'd do, this is such a complicated topic, um, that in addition to Linda's remarks, then we would talk a little bit, but then also open it up for questions and comments and dialogue with you. So there are uh, mics at each end of the room. Um, and we would ask that you use them because we're live streaming it. So if you, if you don't come to the mic, then folks who are watching won't be able to hear. Um, so Linda, by phone, you said so much that was important that I, I, I want to unpack a little bit. Um, one, one side of this, which is really your personal experience in being racialized, um, because one thing that um, you have been personally vilified. And uh, I want you to talk a little bit about, w w from where I stand, I will say that it, it really does feel like you're being attacked as a scary person because of what people assume you represent, more so than what you've actually said. <laughs> But I, I wonder if you talk a little bit about your experience with being vilified and how that relates for you to this process of racializing Islam. Yes. Um, so literally, white supremacists, neo-Nazis, and right-wing Zionists are obsessed with me. Like they wake up in the morning, like I'm the first thing that comes to mind. And I think it's really not about me as an individual. It's more about what I represent. How dare I defy every stereotype and propaganda that they have been forcing about Muslims in America and Arabs in America? How dare I be an independent, outspoken Muslim woman? How dare I organize across movement and build solidarity? God forbid that happens, right? And how dare I resonate with people outside of my community? And when the attacks escalated against me was after the Women's March. How dare I be a Muslim woman in hijab, one of the four national co-chairs of the Women's March, standing on a stage that has just organized over six million people across the world. And that drove them crazy. And what they have engaged in is mostly 99.9% .9 fake news, right? Anybody could write anything on the internet these days, right? And the gullible people, you know, they, they share a link and they're like, but Breitbart News said, thedailycaller.com. And I'm just like, y'all need to kind of check where the resources came from. But what they also have done to me is they have taken me out of context and out of sequence, which is, which is what the right wing is known for, right? These like gotcha type videos. And there are actually things, there are, there's really nothing that they say I said that is actually really controversial when you actually think about it. I'm gonna give you an example. Excuse me that you don't understand my snark. I'm from Brooklyn, that's what I do for a living, I'm snarky. When we were having paint, we, we call it Brooklyn swag. It's Brooklyn swag. And it's like, you, got, you know, we got a little edge to us, right? That people don't understand us, unless you're from Brooklyn. So I'm gonna give you an example just to see the ludicrous of these folks. We were having a paid sick leave fight here in New York. You all remember that a few years ago. I tweeted facetiously that even in Saudi Arabia, 
Mind you, everybody knows what Saudi, do I have, is it really, do I have to be clear? Saudi Arabia is one of the biggest violators of human rights in the world. Like, who doesn't know that? Did I need to have like, you know, I don't know what you call footnotes in my tweet? I, 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 so I facetiously said that even in Saudi Arabia, they have paid 10 weeks paid maternity leave. God, the world went, the wor world was over. So if you looked at my tweets in sequence, you would have totally got what I was saying. But if you didn't, you would be like, wow, Linda's like praising Saudi Arabia. Are you out of your mind? You're lucky if Saudi Arabia lets me into their country. Like I am everything that Saudi Arabia does not want when they talk about Islam. So that's one example of something that they have said about, uh, like said that Linda's Sharia law and she's gonna like take over America. Well, I'm doing a damn bad job at it, at it if that's what you think I'm doing. Um, so that's just an example of like this whole, like I'm a radical supremacist. I also organize with an organization in, in the United States called CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, and they also have a New York chapter. And they're an organization, they're the largest Muslim civil rights organization in the country. They're, the, they're like our version of like the NAACP. And the right wing has said Muslim Brotherhood, you know, the, the stuff they said about Huma Abedin, about uh, Keith Ellison, who's African American. He has, what is an African American guy born in Detroit got anything to do with freaking Muslim Brotherhood all the way to the other side of the world? But of course, that's what they do, they don't care. The point is, because I am affiliated and organized with the Council on American Islamic Relation, then by 16 degrees of, of, of you know, connection, somehow I must be the Muslim Brotherhood. So these are the kind of things that they wanna put out there about folks like me. And the question is, and I say this to people all the time, that this is just a rep repetition of history. That's why I'm honored, I love it. Dr. Martin Luther King, the most, he was named the most dangerous man by the FBI. He wrote you a letter from the Birmingham jail. He was a victim of police brutality. Only 30% of Americans during the civil rights movement agreed with Dr. King. So don't let it, nobody fool you that everybody was down with the civil rights movement when Dr. Martin Luther King was running. So I'm not the first leader to ever be vilified um, in the work that I do. The thing that just took it a little bit, the, the, where the level got to, just so folks know what's going on here, I don't mind the haters, I don't mind the people that are taking me out of context, the people, because I'm a critic of the state of Israel, then obviously for some that means I'm, no, by default, if you are a critic of the state of Israel, for some people that you are an anti-Semite, and Dr. Maya knows me very well, my closest allies in New York City are members of the Jewish community, and I have organized with them for 16 years and continue to do so. But it's the death threats. You don't gotta agree with me, but you don't gotta, threaten my life, and you don't have to threaten my children's life. You don't have to tell me that I follow a violent religion, but then you want to commit acts of violence against me. And I'm not, I'm not going to even repeat the things. Law enforcement has access to all that information. So I have, ha I have security. I have surveillance cameras around my house in New York City. I don't live in like the boonies of Arkansas. I'm talking about in Brooklyn. And the fact that I don't feel safe in my own city is really a message to everyone that women of color in particular, organizers, Black Lives Matter leaders will tell you the same thing. I was hanging out with them in LA. They got the similar situation. We are being attacked, threatened by neo-Nazis and white supremacists who do not want us to organize, who are trying to take us down by any means necessary. And that's the situation that we live every day. And I, th I think what's so important about those examples are that facts, uh, facts matter. Um, and there really are some facts that are not contested. But when we have a system of propaganda, which is now taking new forms, social media being a really active one, um, we can vilify and generate more racial stereotyping and hatred through those mechanisms. And I, I think your experience is, is very much that. Um, I, I actually, one of the things you've talked so both eloquently um, and sincerely about the importance of seeing our strugg struggles in a united way, because many different groups have been racialized in this country in many ways. Jews were not mm. always white, and experienced tremendous um, discrimination and vi violence <laughs> um, in this country, not, not just in Europe. And um, you talked about the Japanese internment. One of the things that happened, I, I'm going to share a per, a, somewhat of a personal story, but ask where you're seeing some signs of hope now. But, you know, one of the things I did as a um, young lawyer uh, at the ACLU was, this was the first Gulf War. And um, so this was George, the other George Bush. <laughs> um, the, 
So, and again, this is before we're talking about um, Islamophobia in, the, in, its, in its hardening, calcifying form that I think has happened since 9-11. And then Pan Am Airlines started profiling anyone that it thought was Arab um, for strip searches, pulling off of airplanes, not letting them fly. Uh, and this was, this, we, didn't, we hadn't had a terror attack like September 11th yet, so this was before that. And one of the most, I, I, one of our named plaintiffs, um, was Mohammed Ganudian, who's a photographer, um, amazing photographer, and um, he was running to catch the plane he was late for, and he was a photographer, so he had a, a camera bag with film in it. And so, and he was sweaty because he had been running to make a plane, and they literally had stopped him. Needless to say, he didn't make the plane. They actually, he got through security after a very traumatic experience because they were going to try to expose his film, and his film was his livelihood. Um, they finally found a way to get him through security. He got all the way to the airplane, and the pilot said, "I want him off." Um, Muhammad was Egyptian and so he did not look white. But what they started to do, with the other plaintiffs that we had in the case, there was an elderly Israeli, Jewish Israeli couple. Uh, they did not look white. And so our conception of what it actually means to look Jewish was confused <laughs> about what it means to look like people who are from a shared region. Um, and so your example was that it, it, the level of discrimination and in some instances violence, because strip search is about one of the most violent things one can experience in that kind of setting, was happening to people who were not Arab. And by the way, on all Arabs, as we know, are not Muslim. Um, so even profiling by looking Arab was its own confusion mm -hmm. if, if the fear was around people who were Muslim. Um, and that was before September 11th. It obviously happened all over again after September 11th. Um, and the ACLU is still bringing lawsuits like this. But nonetheless, and that's just the sort of a lesson of how confusing our racialization is, but it also seems to me that there's been so much more resistance. And what are, where, what are you seeing as the opportunities uh, and the hopeful points about resisting that form of racialization? I think you gave one with the census, but what are some of the others that you're seeing? I think, um you know, within the work that I do, a lot of my focus is on anti-black racism within the Arab community um, and the communities that I grew up with. And I think we have to realize that we talk about racism as it something being exterior to the communities that we come from when in fact our own communities engage in all forms, homophobia, transphobia, you know, anti-black racism. And I think we are challenging this, these ideas um, within the communities uh, that we are from and this kind of new generation of understanding the intersectionality of the communities that we come from is what's hopeful to me. It is where I organize from. And I actually, you know, the, this term intersectionality, by the way, is a term that was coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. She kind of brought it into life, you know, into, she spoke it. And I feel like our generation is speaking it into work and on the ground um, in a way that is really powerful. And um, other ways and just really connecting these issues and these policies and this kind of opposition um, from a place of the criminalization of communities of color in particular and wa watching you know Arab Americans, African Americans who could be both of those things and Latinos who can be all I mean the, the even when we talk about the different movement and who do we organize with so when I say I'm organizing with black people, people expect that to mean black, Christians or black non-Muslims, but it also includes black Muslims. Talk about Latinos, that could also mean Latinos who are also Muslims, right? When you think about any other group of people, there's so much crossover in the communities that we come from. The reason why that's important and that ha helps to challenge is that we have been taught to put ourselves in different kind of groups based on our identity or based on the way others perceive our identity. And what that does, is it actually divides us in the movement, right? So each group is kind of organizing on their own. And I think what we're doing now is we're defying that by saying, no, I could be Muslim, I could be Palestinian, I could be from Brooklyn, I could be a parent, I could be all of these things, and I can come into this space and organize as a whole person. And this is what the movement now is about and where young people are pushing this movement. And I think that that is where the hope is and why we're seeing so much intersectional organizing and why the Women's March was successful. 
Because what people don't understand about the Women's March in particular is that there's all different kinds of stories. I get to tell the story because I was part of it. The story is that three of the four national co-chairs are women of color. One is African American, one is Chicana Muslim, one is Chicana Mexican, and I was a Palestinian Arab Muslim, right? When we came to the Women's March, originally the Women's March was about reproductive rights and equal pay. Because that's what white women want to talk about. And then when we got there, people said, people started talking about, oh yeah, of course, we want to center women of color and give them seats at the table. We didn't want a seat at the table. We wanted to be on the table. And what we did was at the Women's March, if people noticed, is that everybody was at the Women's March. Environmental justice folks, racial justice, economic justice folks, across the gamut. Reproductive rights, people talking about equal pay, every, every issue. Why? Because we wanted to show people that you could actually organize intersectionally without diluting a message. And actually build a movement that brought out 3.5 million people in this country. Why? Because everybody saw themselves in it. Everyone was like, oh yeah, they got so-and-so, they got indigenous women, oh, so-and-so is speaking, so-and-so is a partner, the environmental justice folks. Of course, they were still critics and they were welcomed. The critics had very important critiques of the Women's March. But we were able to prove that you could build mass mobilizations around a multitude of issues. Because when you ask people to come to the table, don't ask people to leave stuff out and tell me, oh, this table's about reproductive rights. So all your racial stuff, the racial justice stuff, that doesn't really fit right here. Even equal pay, by the way, having new conversations about equal pay. So we had a conversation in the Women's March when we first got there. So we said, okay, you wanna talk about equal pay? Cool. But you can't talk about equal pay without talking about racial justice. What do you mean by that? Well, okay, women get paid 78% to the dollar, 78 cents to the dollar, right? Right. But black women get paid less than that. And immigrant Latina women get paid even less than black women. So you can't talk about equal pay without talking about race. So being able to infuse the conversations and, and talk about things in a racial justice framework, believe it or not, is new to a lot of people. You may do it because that's probably what you're interested in. Dr. Maya has been doing it for years, but that's not every, how everybody thinks about it. Even when you think about things like environmental justice, people say, Linda, stop confusing me because how does environmental justice connect to racial justice? Flint, Michigan, anybody? Newark, New Jersey? Hurricane Katrina? Like, let's, every, I can connect race to everything. So we're not playing the race card. The race card is dealt to us. So we have to be able to address these things in a more comprehensive way, and the movement now is doing that in a way that honestly we have not done in a really long time in a public way. Not to say that there hasn't been people across this country, in particular in academia and some organizers that of course have been doing it, but it wasn't elevated to this level that we are in right now. So that's really where the hope is. Like the conversations are not happening in silos, they're happening together. Great. And um, I'm going to, just looking at time, and I know we're going to have people, why don't you all start, if you have questions or comments, moving to the mic? Um, but I, I wanted to go back to this, you know, one for, the, for those who are here, because we're talking about racialization a lot. And, um, you know, really what, and Linda said it really well in her remarks, is that what racialization means is you identify people and call them a group and then ascribe characteristics, beliefs, traits to that group, right? And it's something that has happened to many groups over the course of history, and they're not always static. You know, it changes as well over time. Um, one of the things that, you know, when, we, when we're talking, so I'm, this notion of jihad, I think we have to My talk about. Word. And, I, you know, I think many people in this room probably know this, um, but I think it's important to talk about. So. But just as an example of the fake news um, spin and racialization of attributing jihad as a, as a violent form of terror and ascribing that to all Muslims is, I think, part of this racialization process. Uh, and so I'm going to read a headline from the Conservative Review that le said, Linda Sarsour calls for Muslims to wage jihad against Trump. Uh, and then later in the article says, um, this was at a particular speech you made, that it was a particularly vague yet terrifying segment of her speech. Um, and I, I just want to read one part of what she actually said, but have you talk a little bit more about what jihad actually means, because I think this notion of even understanding meaning is a point about how people have power or don't have power. Who gets to say what something means? Um, but what you actually said was, 
uh, and uh, you, uh, after telling a story from Islamic scripture about a man who once asked Muhammad, founder of Islam, what is the best form of jihad or struggle? Maybe a little hint there about the definition. And our beloved prophet said to him, a word of truth in front of a tyrant ruler or leader. That is the best form of jihad. Okay, that doesn't sound so scary to me, but can you comment on, on that? That sounded like democracy, actually. You're a Trump supporter, <laughs> but, but can you comment on that? Um, I, I actually, I know I, I, you're like wondering why I'm laughing at this, is because I was telling Maya that I was telling leaders in my community after that happened, I was like, man, I'm taking one for the team. Um, but, you know, it, that's just an example of people who actually have the audacity to believe that they can define my religion for me. And that they can take words that are not English, like jihad is an Arabic word. I am a fluent Arabic speaker. So you mean to tell me some white man at the conservative review knows more about the Arabic language and the translation of the word jihad more than I do or more than Muslims do? Like this is the, it's like, it's like, it's, it's, it's audacious. Like what, who do you think you are? And one of the things that I'm engaging in, and there's another word that I told, um, that I told, um, Maya about, which is Sharia, Sharia law, right? First of all, it's not Sharia law, actually. It's actually Sharia, because Sharia means law. So you would be saying law, law, if you were saying Sharia law. <laughs> but who cares, right? Who cares about the facts? Sharia is basically like saying Judaic law or canon law, right? Now, we could all argue about different things within each school, each, each of those that we don't agree with. They pretty much share a lot of the same things. Like, you want to talk about homosexuality in Islam? Let's talk about homosexuality in the Torah and in the Bible. Like, this obsession with Islam is the problem, right? So we could, ha we could challenge each other. I'm, I have no problem with people challenging the ideas of Islam. But the minute you hear the word sharia, if that sends chills up your body, if you're locking doors when you hear that word, there's a problem. And the problem isn't with me or with Muslims. It's your problem. It's what you have been reading and what are the things that you're actually believing about what's happening? So what I'm doing is I'm reclaiming my religion. I'm reclaiming my language. Sharia is also an Arabic word. Like, like why would I allow folks to continue to take and claim my language? I'm taking it back. So after that jihad controversy, which by the way was at a Muslim conference, I was talking to my people. My people know exactly what jihad means. I didn't even have to say jihad or struggle, but guess what, because I'm smart. I knew that video was gonna get out, and it did. So I said jihad or struggle, but technically I didn't have to because I was talking to an audience of Muslims only. The fact that I even have to police my own speech, knowing that some neo-Nazi white supremacist is gonna take me and put me online, is crazy. So right after that jihad controversy, what happened was I was able to create a national conversation. The Washington Post got involved, the New York Times, the Huffington Post, you name it, everybody was writing about it. I even wrote a piece about the, I called the Washington Post, I was like, can I speak for myself, please? Because everybody's speaking on my behalf and I have some things to say. They were like, here you go. 800 words, I did like 900, and they were like, it's too good, we're gonna just like, we're just gonna let them keep them up. <laughs> they never do that. that so they I never do that. From but the point is, is that I had to take the brunt of the vicious attacks that I got. So imagine, okay, it got to the point where Donald Trump's son got involved. He tweets at me and tweets at the DNC like, is this the representative of your party, blah, blah, blah. Like, when the, when the president's son is tweeting at you, then we, I, did, I knew I got myself into some trouble. But the point is I created a conversation and I, my own friends who are not Muslim started being like, wow, like I'm learning something new. Like I didn't know and now I know and now I'm learning, now I'm listening. And that's the kind of conversations that we, we wanna have. So what, I, what, I, what I'm asking of you, because everything should have action items, mm -hmm. is when you hear things, challenge them. Ask people where did they get that information from, right? Oh, I read it in an article. What article? Breitbart? You mean, the, you, mean the, you mean where Steve Bannon just went back to? The Daily Caller or the Daily Stormer that, just, that GoDaddy just took, took away their you know, domain and now they're creating another web. By the way, they're creating a whole other internet, just so you all know. But that, so just being able to challenge these ideas is important for all of us to do. Absolutely. Yes. Welcome. Just wanted to say thank you so much for uh, coming to address us this evening. Um, I have two questions. Um, Obama called for blacks to stop making claims against the government and to bind their grievances to the grievances of all Americans. I don't necessarily agree with that, 
because to my mind, it decontextualizes black grievances. So my first question to you is, how would you reconcile that with the quote that motivates you in your work? And my next item is there's a move toward deracialization among black politicians that Andra Gillespie raised in her book, Who's Black Politics? What would be your advice to black politicians who believe they cannot win elections without the white vote? So just to clarify on that original um, quote that I said from Leela Watson, and by no means does that mean that anybody uh, kind of unlayers their own identity politics just so they could be part of a larger movement of liberation, right? If you're black, you're liberating black people so that black people can be free. If you're Latino, you know what I mean? So this is, for me, it's very important. That's why people say that I pay, they say I'm a race baiter, is what they, that's another f famous one, right? Or they say that I always bring race into everything, or I play identity politics, right? I don't play identity poli politics. We don't play black people, Latino people, or people who, who consider themselves to be people of color. We don't play identity politics. Politics plays with us through the policies that target our community. So we have to be, clear about who we are and how we're being targeted. So for example, I work on, my real passion is ending mass incarceration. But the fact of the matter is, I'm not the one that's being incarcerated. It's black people and we need to be clear about that, right? When we look at particular issues, they are impacting certain people more than others and we can't downplay that to act like, oh well, all, it's kind of like saying all lives matter. No, it's live streaming, so I'm not gonna say what I was about to say, but really, of course we know that all lives matter, right? But we know that if certain lives, right, that, that when we people say black lives matter, it's just an attention on a particular community whose lives are, don't really matter to the larger, broader society. So I, I, I don't think that people should be downplaying racialization. I, don't, I think that black politicians, many of whom um, sometimes are on our side and sometimes are not on our side, and I'm gonna say this a little bit about Obama. You think I don't wish the day that Obama comes back and becomes my president? We all do. But, let, but when, when Obama was president, I was a critic of Obama. Obama was the deporter in chief. He deported more immigrants than any other president in US history, right? Towards the end of his reign, yes, he did a lot of important things for us. But Obama also did a lot of things that hurt us. And we need to be uh, clear about that, which is why a lot of communities of color were so disappointed in Obama because he was black and we expected a black president who was a constitutional lawyer to come to our defense and do the best that he could. Except that he came into a presidency in the context of white supremacy. I don't care if the president is black. If we don't create the society for a black president to thrive and do the right things, then it, it could be, we could have a black woman president tomorrow. It's not gonna, it's, it's gonna be important and monumentous and historic, but the systems are still the same. So I hope that kind of answered your question. I think for the political aspect of your question, Hillary Clinton is an example. Over 85% of black women voted for Hillary Clinton. It's always black people who are put in yeah, so people the over the edge. They are the most loyal Democrats mm -hmm. in, of any group of people, including when we talk about women in general. 54% of white women voted for Donald Trump. The reason why Hillary Clinton won the popular vote is because of black people and black women in particular, and particularly those over the age of 40. So I think that they need to find the courage and the statistics that they could win elections just by cultivating people of color communities. Not to say that you're ignoring white voters, they're, of course they're part of your electorate, but I think for too long we have disenfranchised through voter suppression, through other means, mm -hmm. communities of color, and in particularly black voters. And gerrymandering has been and huge gerrymandering because in, in some instances, and the lines get, and incarceration, how votes get counted, has actually made it difficult to have majority minority districts exactly. that make it easier for candidates to represent um, their communities, right? Because the communities then get redrawn. But that's, we are gonna have a class on that, by the way, on December 11th. December 11th. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the inspiring uh, lecture. It was really, uh, it was really insightful as well. Um, I have more of a general question because um, after the, the happenings at Charlottesville, I've been watching some interviews um, and documentaries on FICE on the white su su supremacists and the neo-Nazis. And I was, I was seeing these videos and I, I was genuinely wondering like, where, where does this hatred, this hatred come from? Right? Where does where does it derive from? Um, 
so I, basically what it comes down to is my question is, where do you think it comes from? And also, how do we instigate the, the conversation with these people? And how can we even turn their, their intrinsic, their inherent hatred around? Is that possible, you think? I've been thinking about a lot, a lot about it too. I think that this is just inherently something that's been in this country since the days of its founding. So people have tried for four and a half centuries to figure out how to eliminate white supremacy and I don't know if it's something that we're gonna all do in our lifetime. But what, the reason why it's so outward right now, because back in the days you had the white hoods, now they don't even need the white hoods. Now they're just like, I'm out here with these tiki torches, you all can and see polo me. And polo shirts. And polo shirts and khakis and that's why I am. But I think the reason why we're seeing it in the way that we see it now is very simple, at least in my opinion. It's, it's the changing demographics. We're going to be a majority minority country whether anybody likes it or not. That's just how the world works. So folks like this are thinking to themselves, wait a minute, we were always the majority. Now we're gonna be the minority and trying to kind of find ways to hold on to that power. So what they're doing is the white lash, they're lashing out and projecting the fear of becoming a majority minority country. So by 2030, which is not far from now, that's like 12 years from now, we're gonna be a majority minority country and keep moving that way up until 2050, or what is it, is it 2050? It's 2050 and then demographically already the majority of all 18, 18 and under, about half of all 18 and under that's already. That's what, what Dr. Maya said. But basically by 2050, we're all gonna be, this, we are, the whole country will be a majority minority country. So they're reacting to that. Right? They just came out of the first black president, which for them was another sign Named of them Barack losing. Hussein Obama. Barack Hussein Obama, which was another sign for them that uh, this, uh, it, and, it's, and it's not real, right? Like, so just to be clear, like I'm not justifying it for them. It just, it's just something that they're thinking in their mind. We just elected the first black president. And this is really where, where it all came from. In fact, the mosque opposition that I was talking about earlier started under the Obama administration. Obama was a Muslim, remember that. Right? And he wasn't a Muslim. That's for them he was a Muslim. They're gonna keep saying he was a Muslim. They said he wasn't born here, even though he proved that he was born here. So Obama was the symbol for them of the changing demographics of the United States of America. And that's what they're lashing out about. To the second part of your question, this is where I struggle. I'm not the one that's gonna go talk to them. <laughs> that's just not what I wanna do. I'm gonna support you in that decision. <laughs> I'm, I'm just not the right one. I'm, a, I'm not the right messenger. <laughs> But this is the moment when, when we talk about the silent majority, this is the moment for those folks. So I always say to white folks, you, I, there's so many in our movements right now, they are at the front lines, they have been in solidarity with us, they have come to everything, they organize, they bring resources, amazing. And we love it and we want them to stay there, right? Including many, majority of them being white Jews. But where we really need you is in your communities, in the, in the places where you, were, where you grew up, where you went to school, because you could have those conversations. Because if your mom has voted for Donald Trump, she probably still loves you and, you, and I hope you still love your mother too. And you can have those hard conversations. And I remember when we were organizing the Women's March, we had this conversation with women, the white women who were with us, who were like, oh, I'm not even going home for Thanksgiving. I'm gonna stay here and help, because you know, all of us, no, like I was, I'm from New York, so I was in New York, but a lot of these women were here with us, but actually lives in other parts of the country, and they didn't wanna go home for Thanksgiving. They were like, no, we're staying here to organize with you. I said, you better get yourself on an airplane and go, because Thanksgiving is an important time for you to have the conversation that you should have probably had before Thanksgiving or before the election. So well, all, I, all that to say that the very people, white people in particular, need to be having those conversations. Because if you remember, even on the Charlottesville, somebody's uncle came out and this one's cousin, like people knew those people. And this is the other thing that I don't like when people say, oh, those people are just a fringe part of our community. They're somebody's children. They're somebody's husband. They work in our, they work, they work in our banks. They may be nurses at hospitals. They could be doctors. I don't know what their professions are. The point is that they are members of our society, any way, which way you put it. They're people who are students at universities that we go to. So I, all I'm saying is that we should be having conversations with people who are the most direct in contact with us, which means the people that are around those people. And there are many of them who have family that I'm pretty sure are progressive, that just don't want anything to do with them, and that's just a cop out in my opinion. And it's the level of privilege when you can walk away from your racist uncle who just voted for Donald Trump or, or thinks black people should all be incarcerated or think they're all thugs, that you could actually walk away and be like, I don't wanna have anything to do with it. The real hard work is those conversations. Let me add, I think those are 
incredibly important points. It's one of the reasons I shared the statistic that I did because most people don't realize that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world and the fastest growing religion in the United States and soon will be the second largest, second after Christianity. Um, and that's part of that changing demographic picture. Um, one of the things that uh, the Trump administration was starting to defund before Charlottesville was actually work that targeted intervening with um, young people who were joining right-wing movements. And what those who have come out of some of those right-wing groups, and by right-wing, I shouldn't say right-wing, I mean white supremacist, neo-Nazi, you know, the thing where, that's being rebranded as alt-white, but the fringe, violent, um, racist, dot, dot, dot groups, um, uh, groups that would fall into the category of becoming domestic terrorists, and I think we should call it what it is, it's domestic terrorism, uh, actually are often preyed upon, and there, there's a formula that supremacist groups use to target who is more vulnerable to their message. And that vulnerability, sometimes it's mental illness, and we do not have a public policy in this country around public support for mental illness, and we should. Um, it, it does. It actually, they are often from communities that are economically distressed, and where there are few opportunities for young people who are white. Uh, I think, as Linda said, and in, in the academic world, we sometimes refer to it as targeted universalism. We don't want anyone to be poor, and we have to look at how we're poor differently, and what kind of supports we need to change that, because it differs from community to community. Uh, but certainly, that is one of the factors that can create more vulnerability to folks becoming members of these groups when they're angry, when they're also often, they've been abused by their parents. There's often a lot of sexual and physical abuse of children uh, that makes them more susceptible to white supremacy. So I think there are actually a lot of the policies we call for to actually create safety nets and supports for vulnerable people um, is a great example when Linda says we have to recognize how we're in this together but also position differently would include, would include some of those things that prevent people from becoming the, uh, the folks that get propagandized and organized into white supremacy. And I want to say, I'm going to share one more personal story because, you know, I like Linda, I don't pretend to be an expert in this, but struggle with this. Uh, when I was in college, I had, I, one of my campus jobs was as the minority student liaison for the Com Career and Employment Services Office, which meant, you know, I was the brown student who would greet the recruiters that were intentionally trying to diversify their pool by finding bright young college students and trying to attract them before they made other selections, right? It was a good thing, so that was one of my jobs. And they told me that the, that the Marine Corps recruiter wanted to meet with me. And I had an existential crisis, because I was like, I'm not telling anybody black to go work for the Marine Corps for a whole bunch of reasons that, that I won't go into. But that, and I, that was, that, and then I said, wait, that's not my job. I'm not to make those decisions for people. My job is just to make the connections. Um, I sat down with this captain who was white and from a southern state, from a rural place in a southern state. And you know, we sat down and one of the things I started grilling him on is, why should, uh, why, what, what would you tell me to tell any of the black students on campus why they should consider the Marine Corps? And he just said, I, I'm recruiting because it changed my life. And you know, he got really misty and this was one of those interpersonal moments that can be very rare because I didn't have any white friends who went into the Marine Corps. Um, and so I didn't understand it from his perspective. And the more we talked and the more we, and we had several meetings over the course of time, and eventually what came out was he was a Klansman. Um, informally, I mean, but literally he said he thought black people were um, the lowest forms of life and every problem he saw in his rural community was the responsibility of shiftless, lazy black people. Um, and that he said if he hadn't gone into the military, he may well have become actually violent, uh, a violent member of, of a group. And this took, we didn't get to this conversation overnight, I promise you. Um, but as we were talking about it, and then I found out, he, he got sent to Central Africa. 
And when he got sent to Central Africa, um, what used to be called Zaire, just, just to date this conversation, um, he literally said it, it transformed his life. Both the people he got to know in the military who were black, who did not meet the stereotypes that he had come to, he didn't have black people in his community. He just had stereotypes about black people. And then the secondly, to see black Africans very, and the richness of their history and the culture and the sophistication changed him. And um, this is not a story that necessarily, I think, happens to everyone just because they join the military, but it does underscore what generals have actually been saying about the critical importance of an inclusive, diverse society, which is that it makes us better. Because the more we know of one another and the more we have authentic experiences with one another, the less susceptible we are to the stereotypes that other people and then make them more likely to do bad, horrible things or take bad, horrible positions. Um, I'm with Linda, that won't address everyone, but I think we should recognize, the, and those are policies that we can actually drive, right? Those are, those are policy decisions that we can make. And the, I'll just end that story by saying, then I met his wife, who was black, wow. and Zairean. All right. <laughs> Thank you. And I just wanted to add one, one quick thing about the, uh, there was a program under the Obama administration called CVE, Countering Violent Extremism. I was a critic of that program because it was countering violent extremism, but we, they were only targeting Muslim communities. So you can't be like violent extremism, not to say that I wanted them to target other groups, but the point was it wasn't addressing the actual problem. So then Trump came along and was like, let me specify for you what I really meant. So in fact, there is a, still a program, it's called this now. Countering violent jihadism, like he, they made, like Trump made up a word. Um, so now there's an explicit program that specifically looks at violent jihad by the administration. Which, what, what does that say? That says that they will ignore violence happening at the hands of white supremacist groups, who in fact are the majority group since the horrific attacks of 9/11 they are the majority domestic terrorists or make up the majority of that group. And we now don't have a program that is looking at violent extremism coming out of white supremacist corners. So that's just how racialization works. Um, I'm especially passionate about the correlation of self-care and activism, and how do you avoid burnout? I'm the wrong person to be asked. <laughs> Um, I just came back from Jordan, mm -hmm. like a few days ago, and my idea of self-care is being in Ramtha, Jordan, on the border between Syria and Jordan, working with refugees. Like, that's what I thought was a way, um, and I will say that it was, there was some therapeutic aspect of it that kind of put life in perspective to understand that while we sit here and kind of think about all the things that we're going through as a country and seeing people in particular Syrian refugees who lived wonderful lives before they got to Jordan and to see in them and their children was um, both, I can't explain it, it, it was, it was, it, it felt good to be with them and to build with them and to, to spend my Muslim holiday with them, but then it also um, was a very hard moment for me. So that's why I'm not the right person because I thought that was, I was like, oh, I'm just gonna go to Jordan for, six days and mm -hmm. spend time with refugee families and learn their stories and help and do community service. Um, I think that's the problem in the movement right now, that self-care also requires resources. And the reason why I was able to go to Jordan is because I went on a volunteer mission with an organization. So that means that they paid my way to go. Um, and then self-care sometimes could be simple things, but really there's like 10 people in the movement nationally right now that someone needs to send them to Hawaii. Yeah. I'm serious, like these are people that can't just go get a manicure. These are people that need to be put somewhere on an island and told not to answer their phones, to go swim in a beach somewhere, but these things require resources, and those that need it the most in the movement don't have the resources to do that, right? You know, I'm a parent. Like, when I leave here and go home, I got a kid that wants this and that, I gotta go do laundry and things like that. Like, people have to understand that those that are on the front lines right now in the movement are those that are of the most directly impacted communities and are the people that are themselves most directly impacted. So not only are they dealing with the work of the movement that never ends, unfortunately, but also have to deal with normal everyday stresses of life, pay your bills, you know, your rent is due, like we're, like these are actual struggles that are people having in the movement. So the, the question I ask back, you know, to all of us is like, when we think about building a movement, is there space within the movement to build that self-care that is structured? so that when the foundations are funding the movements, do we think and say, 
you know what, I'm gonna give them 120,000. And that 20,000 should go to these key leaders for self-care, right? Because we don't usually donate, why? That's a luxury. What do you mean you wanna go on a vacation? Like, that's not, so I think that self-care is an actual hard conversation that's being had in the movement right now. Thank you. Hi, thank you for being here tonight. Um, so in building intersectional movements, I feel like a challenge is that people in power have been devising divide and conquer strategies for so long and pitting impacted communities against each other. So I'm just wondering if you have ideas of like, how do we move forward? How do we unlearn all these things to really build connected intersectional spaces? It's called losing, seriously. And I know that you're looking at me like, what do you mean by that? It means that we lose together. And the re what, what you said was exactly how the system is set up. The system is set up to divide and conquer us. And so if, when we're doing, for example, when we were doing immigration reform, I'll give you an, a, a real example. They were talking about border security and national security loopholes in the larger Senate bill that was being debated a few years ago, which meant that the border, people coming, the people on the border, and Muslims were gonna get thrown under the bus in the name of comprehensive immigration reform. They were like, don't worry, we'll debate that later, let the bill pass. Oh, I see. So throw my people under the bus and create national security loopholes for Muslims, but then everybody else is cool. And that was unacceptable because we have been taught to take crumbs, crumb, 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 because we would never ever see the entire cookie. But guess what happened? We still lost comprehensive immigration reform. So the, the, the way that I organized from, look, I want the whole cookie. And I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. And the question is, can we lose together with dignity and principles? Because if eventually we will win. So over the years we have been seeing example, I can sit here and give you example after example of how many times we have sold each other, thrown different communities under the bus and we still lost. The intersectionality for me is bringing everybody to the table and coming up with an agreement. Don't throw me under the bus, I won't throw you under the bus. And if we don't get all that we want, we lose. But you know what? We lose with dignity, and then when we win, we win without throwing anybody under the bus. And I think that that's where we're at in a movement right now. And believe it or not, this administration is the best playing field to learn on, right? Because in, this is one administration you do not compromise with. I'm telling you right now. This is not a negotiation with an administration like this one. And that is why what you're going to see is anytime we see, quote, one of us go into negotiate with neo-Nazis and white supremacists and anti-Semites, you better believe they're not part of the movement anymore. And I'm saying that here for the record, because this is not an administration to compromise with. It was easier to do that under an Obama administration. And you know damn sure well we would have done that under a Hillary administration too. So the question here went back to Dr. Maya when she asked me what was hopeful. I see light in the darkness that you all see before your eyes. And there is a blessing in a crazy man and a racist, misogynist, sexist like Trump. And the blessing is that he has taught us that we cannot win this alone, that we have to organize together. And that each of us in our movements alone is not enough. Black people are not enough alone. Muslims alone are not enough. LGBTQ communities fighting by themselves is not enough. Under an administration like this one, we all gotta organize together. So we were forced to organize together and all of a sudden I was like, hmm, this actually is working out really great. I mean, you saw that healthcare, out people mobilizing out in these streets, in the groups like Indivisible that have come up, you know, groups like the Women's March, the tripling of groups like moveon.org and Color of Change and, and ACLUs and even the local organizations like the robust organizing that's happening. Maybe we needed, and, and, I, and, and, and people can quote me on this one, maybe, Maybe Trump is what we needed all these years to teach us a really bad lesson the hard way about what it means to organize together and intersectionally. And I'm taking advantage of working under administration like this one because finally, we have, a lot of us have put our ideological differences aside to basically say, look, I'm not a neoliberal, you're into capitalism, I'm not. But right now, I'll take a couple of capitalists and a couple of neoliberals to fight some white supremacists. That's where I'm at right now. So I hope you're on the same page. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Ray. I'm a student here at Lang. Um, first, I wanna say you have my respect and admiration for being unapologetic um, and being proud and telling it like it is. Um, 
you know, I, when Trump was elected, I was, you know, attending the school and I remember taking part in the walkout and, 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 and protesting. And I think as a young man of color, being the uh, son of immigrants from the Dominican Republic, um, I will say that you, you touch on a lot and that affected me, um, especially the whole silent majority thing, people turning, um, you know, some whites might like not uh, want to acknowledge or from a distance want to help, but they choose not to. Um, and uh, I am in the process of writing an article for the New School Free Press, um, thinking about calling it being black in a white space and being white in a black space because there's a class being taught here called black psychology being taught by a black woman. There's only two white students in this class. And to me, that is, is, is kind of mind boggling. You know, um, I was here at the first lecture series and I we learned that MLK, Martin Luther King, gave a speech here. And I believe that this school is founded on amazing, like, progressive ideals. But how, you know, how do I, I'm trying to make sense of it too. Because I have, you know, white friends and I, it, it just doesn't make sense how there's still this division. You know, are you with us or are you against us? Kind of, you know. I think that that's um, kind of where everybody is, right? It's kind of like you're actually sitting here thinking to yourself, you know, who's with me and who's against me? And I think the question here is that if you're not with me visibly, then you must be against me. And that's the question. That, that kind of back to that quote where it says, if you haven't chosen a side, right? Like you, if, if you can't be neutral, right, in the face of oppression, which means that you chose the side of the oppressor. And I think it's about creating those important, what we call at the Women's March, courageous conversations. We have to have these courageous conversations. Like, you know, oftentimes we just don't want to have those conversations. Why is there a black psychology class and only black people are going to the black psychology class? Why is there a class that's called black in American history and only black people are there, right? The idea that we need to take that extra step to understand, like I, when I was, when I was in college, I was in the, I was the, in my, I, I was the only non-black student and actually at that time, as a 19 year old, that even was like, this is really weird. I, like you would think black people, generally speaking, would know their history. And I expected the class not to have actually a lot of black people in it. But my point is, is like you writing that article is gonna spark a discussion in the school, right? You bringing that up in a class that you are in, maybe not that black psychology class, because you're basically gonna kind of be preaching to the choir, is what we have to start to doing. And oftentimes we don't wanna shake the boat. And what I do for a living is I want to shake that boat. Anytime I'm in a place, I want to rock the boat. And you may not like me at that moment. You may not agree with me on that moment, but you're going to be like, damn, I never thought about it like the way that that woman explained it. And I'm going to think about something in a different way. So I say to anybody in this room, regardless of who you are, assert yourself. Assert your opinion. Put it out in the room. And we can do that from a place of respect. I'm not saying go in there and like start to, you know, tearing up folks. And I'll just say this to white folks for a second especially when people hear things when we say white supremacy and when we have conversations about white women who voted for Trump or whatever, it's not about you. And that's what happens, the defensiveness on an individual level. When I'm talking about white supremacy, it's obviously not about white people. And in fact, I hope as white people that you also want to end white supremacy. And what happens is that there becomes a defensiveness, right? And then people who are people of color trying to have a courageous conversation with you don't want to have that courageous conversation with you anymore because you can't handle it. In fact, it is the moment to sit and say, I want to listen. I want to learn. And believe me, you will get the utmost respect just for listening to someone who has been hurt in many, many ways for generations that has a lot of trauma and they want to share it with you. And to be honest, I will say this also. If I'm a person of color having a courageous conversation with a white person, I hope that you're honored. And let me tell you why. Because I trust you enough to share my pain with you. I don't have to share it with every white person that I find, but when I do do that, it is because there's something inherently about you that made me open up to you. So if we start reframing the way that we engage in conversations, we will be in a better place. Even within the movement, we have a lot of problems with white folks who hear us use certain terms, or sometimes people are so angry about a white cop that, that shot a black person, and they start saying white people, white people, and the white people are like, see? But you're saying white people. Like, I'm not like that, I've been here, and it's not about you and your feelings. It's really not about you. And, 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 I, and I'm not saying, you know, and, and I just want you to say when people say that to you, it's the same thing when I go into it. When I go into an all black space, I don't go in there saying hashtag free Palestine. It's not, for, it's not my space, 
When I go into a space that is about Black Lives Matter or police accountability, that is why I'm there. So I don't stop and say, excuse me, I wanna make sure that you make me feel comfortable while I'm here. And I wanna also understand, are you also, um, do you also care about Islamophobia and things that are happening to Muslims, just making sure? It's not about me in that moment. Organically, the black folks will be like, nah, we got you on that Muslim ban. We're gonna see you at the airport. I don't have to say anything because it's about the reciprocation of solidarity when you are showing up for other people and understanding that it's not about our individual feelings, but it's about the mission while you're in that space. So those things happen, we're all gonna be in a much better place. Great, thank you. I'm gonna to go to this side of the room because we haven't had one from this side. And these will be our last two. Um, but let me just say, because uh, I know it's gonna happen, everyone's gonna to wanna to talk to Linda because you should want to talk to Linda. Um, but we are having a reception immediately following and Linda is gracious enough to give her a little bit more of her time despite that she has family at home and laundry to do. Um, so we invite you to join us at the reception. So don't consider the end of these two questions, the end of the conversation. Yes. Oh, sure. oh, thank you for coming, I appreciate it. Um, I guess I had a question about um, racialization before 9-11, um, because Maya brought that up with profiling on planes. Um, and I was specifically thinking about like the Battle of Algiers and how that was used by the US government as training for the Pentagon. Um, both before and after 9-11. Um, and also thinking about uh, the project of Real Bad Arabs and how it kind of talks about the way um, for a very long time media has portrayed Muslim people and Arab people in a very specific light. Um, and then I guess the other question I had was about how do you personally, because um, you say you're unapologetic about your identity, how do you deal with having to combat co-options of you know, specific terms and words um, that are important to you and also how your identity is used in a political environment and the conversation and topic of so many, um, you know, places and people who really don't necessarily know what they're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Real Bad Arabs is a book that was written by um, Shaheen, who, Jack Shaheen, who actually passed away recently, just a few weeks ago, um, and I recommend it. Basically, it talks about the kind of demonization and vilification of the kind of characters that have been used in media, right? So obviously the Arabs are always the hijackers of the planes, we're always the bad guys and the terrorists, and that's kind of how we have, that's how Arabs have been introduced, right, to the broader public, that's who we've always been, um, and particularly in the media. And I think the media is such a powerful tool, right? And it, it defines and shapes how people look at other people, right? And it's where a lot of stereotypes come from. So yes, and also when we think about programs like COINTELPRO, right? Um, and we, when I talked about unwarranted surveillance of Muslim communities in 2000, you know, you know, after 9/11, but COINTELPRO was happening way before, right? And the infiltration of Muslim communities way before, right? Including the Nation of Islam, right? When we think about Malcolm X and we think about um, the undercovers, you know, NYPD undercovers that were in within the Nation of Islam and the the specific targeting of Muslims, right? In, in politics or in, in political arenas. Like this is nothing new. Like so it's not just the post 9-11 phenomenon. It just escalated because it was more justified after a horrific attack like 9-11, where we can now do it in basically do it again 2.0 style. And to your second question is I this is what I say to Muslims in my community, right? I say to Muslims, if you woke up this morning and you're breathing, you're political. I don't want to hear anybody tell me about I don't like politics and politics ain't my thing. You're walking, breathing politics in this country. Because our religion has been politicized. We have been racialized. We could fight against that, but also understand that we have no, I think, I tell Muslims, you have no choice but to be active and engaged right now in the society. That we have the responsibility, number one, to defend our religion in this country and defend our communities, right? Every community has the right to defend our, their communities. So I shouldn't be criminalized for defending Muslims in America. That is my right to defend my community and to ensure that they have the same freedoms and access, access as every other community in this country. And again, the, politici the politicization of the words that we use and our religion, right? The fact that imams in this country, this is all documented, are recording their sermons with the fear that their sermons will be taken out of context, right? And because of that, their congregations criminalized and vilified. Who does that? Please name people in other faith groups who think that by, not because they want to live stream it, but because they want it to be on the record just in case. Or the fact that even imams after my jihad comment, I had some immigrant imams from different parts of the country call me and say, Sister Linda, we love you and we appreciate you, but you gotta be careful. 
And I was like, be careful about what? They were like, can't say stuff like jihad. And I said, but isn't that part of our religion? I said, is the, is, I, said, I actually asked this one imam, I said, is the hadith, which is a part of our scripture that I said, is it, did I, did I quote it correctly? He said, no, it was 100% correct. But just, and I was like, no, you could do that, but I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm sorry. Like if that's, if I did it correctly, then I'm good. I was just worried I made a mistake. He was like, it was 100% correct. So my point is, is that as a young person in my community who was born and raised here, being able to instill the moral courage in my community to be unapologetically Muslim is a struggle. And it's a valid, and it, their fear is valid, as we saw. And I'll end by saying one, one last thing um, that I didn't say earlier. When people talked about, oh, well, there, how could there ever be a Japanese internment of Muslims style because you know there's a lot of Muslims and how will we find all the Muslims? There's a lot of ways that they can start. We have a no-fly list got everybody's name on it, a lot of people's names on it, millions of people are on it. We also have the suspected terror watch list that's overbloated. There's even people on it who are not Muslim, but most of them are Muslim. Like There are actually foundational databases that already exist that they can start from. So it doesn't have to be a sweep of every mosque in America. They can just be like, you know what, we're gonna start with these 1.8 million people right here. So I just want people to, to understand that the, Mus the, the fears of Muslims is valid. Because again, reinforcing what has happened in the past doesn't mean there's no one that's giving me a reassurance in any way possible that tells me that we can't and we are not as a nation capable of doing something horrific like that again. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Uh, early, you, I was reminded by this talk that early this morning I had a sleeping dream that like one I've never had before where everybody in the dream was either African American or black, not necessarily African American, and they're all kind of crowded together, men and women. And then when I woke up, I thought, that's different for me. And I thought, is it because of Hurricane Irma and all the people in the Caribbean? Or am I channeling something from like the ancient horrible passage of the Africans to the Americas in the horrible situation? And it could be that, because a couple of days ago, I had a conversation with an old acquaintance of mine, African-American woman from America, who I was telling her that I heard that the Statue of Liberty was ori originally by the sculptor, supposed to be an African woman. Yes, she is. That, and and she and, and but then I said I heard that he it was steps were taken uh, against that by whoever was in power, and that it was supposedly the face of his mother, quote unquote. And this woman, Debbie, she said to me, "Oh, yes, it is an African woman, and you can tell because there are chains on her feet." And she said, the Africans are the only people who came to the Americas with their feet in chains. And, you know, like, I know this, but I had, it was the first time I kind of heard it from mm -hmm. somebody I knew. And maybe that's why I had that dream. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, like, people have to become more aware. And also, a while ago, I was thinking how, I mean, even Trump said something about this, but like, a while before that, I was thinking, Gee, it might be weird for African Americans to have like a uh, George Washington on the dollar bill or whatever, mm -hmm. because he owned slaves and other people on certain other dollar bills who also were in that category. Not all of them. I mean, Lincoln's on the five mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, just like that kind of thing. So I just mm -hmm. want to mention it. Thank you for that. Um, Linda, so before we close, okay, you know, I finally got this up because I had decided we were not going to just have a, just a pure academic lecture and I was going to have video in and out. So I'm going to have video as you leave. Um, but, I, but I really wanted to do a couple things before we close. Um, one, I want to thank, recognize and thank Susan Halpern, one of our trustees here at the New School, who... Um, who is really one of the people who's responsible for the fact that we have this lecture series in the first place um, and has endowed my chair, um, but has been an incredible resource uh, to the city of New York as well in supporting human and community groups and services. So thank you, Susan. Um, and I also want to thank, because you know so many people make these things happen and they don't get acknowledged and recognized, and I think it's critically important. So one, Larry Jackson in the back from the provost office. And Les, is Les here? Les, okay. I mean, he'll, they'll be at, they're working, see? And, and Beryl, who is our amazing uh, teaching assistant. And I'm sorry I don't know your name. 
but we have a whole row of folks who have been, and I'm, this is my bad, but, but, but I just want to acknowledge you and thank you because you all have been making it happen every week and will continue to and we really appreciate it and our live streamers. Um, so much of what happens here at the New School, there's so many staff, students, faculty, trustees who do so much to make these things a reality and I want that to be visible to everyone and this has been tremendously important to have your support, so thank you. Uh, and before we leave, I really want to give Linda the last word. Um, thank you for your wisdom and for your commitment and for your, yeah. Um, but I also want you to give us just whatever last thing you want us to walk out the room with, um, because this is, a, I think, a unique opportunity for us to have that wisdom. So I'm an organizer. So I mean, I'm going to tell you to do some real stuff. Um, so there's four things that I tell people to do. The first thing is, if we don't know one another, we're not gonna protect one another. That's just a fact. So I ask you when you go home, whoever lives in your apartment complex, who lives down the hall from you, who lives downstairs, knock on the door, introduce yourself to them. Start building that kind of one-on-one -on -one community. A lot of people also work after school, and they tell me they don't even know who the guy is that is like in the next cubicle over. So the fact that that's not happening actually scares the hell out of me, that we don't know each other on that level. The second thing is, I don't care if you're a student or not, we all can afford something. There's a lot of organizers in places like New York City or maybe in your hometown that are busting their butts every single day with minimal resources. 10 bucks a month, whatever you can, be a sustainable donor to an organization, in particular a grassroots one in the communities that you come from. The third thing, be informed. Don't say, I don't wanna know what's going on in the world, I don't care, this is really bothering me. Be well informed about what's happening, because if you don't know what's happening, then you're not gonna be able to help or address what's going on around you. And there are communities that are counting on you knowing what's going on so that you can act. The fourth thing that I say to people is the most simple thing, at least in my opinion, show up. Show up. You hear that there's a rally happening to protect kids who are DACA, or if there's a rally, uh, you know, someone got shot by a police officer, show up. And people say, oh, does it matter? I'm only one person, you know, they won't miss me when I get there. Imagine if every woman that showed up at the Women's March was like, they're just not gonna miss me if I don't come. Right now, you have no choice to be sitting in your classroom or in your home being like, I'm so angry about what's happening from the comfort of your couch. Under a fascist administration, we need public dissent. And dissent for me is the highest form of patriotism. And if people don't see masses in the streets engaging in dissent, Someone in a high place somewhere thinks that it's all okay and that there's no opposition out here. So we, our opposition has to be visible. And the last thing that I'll say, usually I say four, but I have five now, because <laughs> when you're sharing information, especially in the age of social media, we have the opportunity to be responsible in the way that we do that. So when you're sharing information, don't share something that you didn't read anywhere else, right? Sometimes people share stuff like somebody died and they didn't die because no one else corroborated that information, but you, had, you felt like you wanted to spread fake news, right? Also, where did you get that news from? If you're sharing neo-Nazi white supremacist websites, you're not actually helping the movement or, the op or you're actually helping the opposition. So don't share Breitbart, don't share, don't share Daily Caller, don't share Conservative Review, the National Review. There's a list of them. Be really careful because the more that you share these types of information, the more that you're putting people at danger and putting communities at danger and confusing the debate that is happening out there, right? So what did I say? Get to know one, in, one another, donate what you can, be informed, show up, and don't share fake news.